Welcome. I'm Pastor Jonathan Crail, Senior Pastor here at First United Methodist Church of DeKalb, and I'm so thankful that you found us here on Facebook Live as we worship this morning on this last Sunday of 2020. Can you believe it? We've survived, almost. But we're so glad that you found us on December 27, 2020, as we gather from around the world to worship online. And so thank you for joining us. And and we are so greatly blessed to have one of our church members, our lay members, Cynthia Terwilliger, bringing our message later on. I'm out of town at the moment, and that's why I'm coming to you in this form. But we look forward to having Cynthia share with us uh, about one more step into Christmas. So welcome, and if you haven't already done so, let us know where you're worshiping from, who's worshiping with you, and greet one another this morning as we celebrate this time to worship together. And if you're new this morning, please say, I'm new, in the comments, and we'll reach out to you via Facebook, or take out your phone and text the word welcome to 815-605-6688, and that way we'll be able to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you better. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. And before we begin our time of worship, just a few Uh, brief announcements or updates so that we know what's going on. Uh, So take a look. God bless you. As we begin this new year at the end of the week, we invite you to mark your calendars for January 10th when we begin a new worship series called For the Health of It. I mean, after a crazy 2020, are you looking for a fresh start? I am. Maybe life isn't exactly where you want it to be and you long for things to be better, different, but you need a simple plan to go with your growing faith. So don't miss the opportunity to step into your best created you through some mind, body, and soul work. Plan to join us again for our New Year's worship series starting Sunday, January 10th, as we talk about faith, friends, food, fitness, and focus. The series is based on Reverend Rick Warren's book, The Daniel Plan. In fact, you can get a free summary booklet available for each family by contacting our church office at office at firstumc.net to reserve your copy. But plan to join us for this great series as we start off the new year in the best shape possible physically, spiritually, spiritually, and emotionally. One other note, we want to let you know that the church office is closed until Monday, January 4th. If you have a pastoral emergency during this time, just call the church office and leave a message. We'll have staff checking the message on a regular basis. Well, now we turn to the reason that we're here, and that's to open our hearts and minds to the power and presence of God as we share together in worship. We begin with the passing of the peace, and so I say to you, the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Go ahead and greet your neighbors or greet each other online as we prepare to worship together and then turn to our call to worship led by Fran Klukas. Please join me for the call to worship. Read aloud with me on the text labeled People. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Come, let us worship and bow down. We come to worship our Savior and King. Amen. Let us join our voices together as we sing this great carol of the season, Angels We Have Heard on High.
Psalm 148 is a great hymn of praise. Read responsively with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they are created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bonds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from earth, you sea monsters and all depths. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfill his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying fish, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above heaven and earth. He has raised up the horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. We respond to this hymn with a hymn of our own, all creatures of our God and King.
Our Gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. When the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simon came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the failing and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also the prophet Anna, the daughter of Penel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and favor of God upon him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture.
Let us prepare our hearts for the message this morning as we join together in our prayer of preparation. Let us pray. O Lord, we come this morning knee-bowed and body-bent before thy throne of grace. O Lord, this morning bow our hearts beneath our knees and our knees in some lonesome valley. We come this morning like empty pitchers to a full fountain with no merits of our own. O Lord, open up a window of heaven and lean out far over the battlements of glory and listen this morning. Amen. Blessings and joy to you this first Sunday after Christmas. My name is Cynthia Terwilliger and I am a certified lay speaker from the UMC Blue Ridge District in Western North Carolina. But now I belong to this church. I'm very grateful to Reverend Crail for this opportunity to be with you today. It's especially wonderful to be talking to you from this sanctuary. For you see, I was baptized and confirmed here, as was my father before me and his father before him. Oh, and my great uncle, Roy Terwilliger, designed this sacred space. It's truly a blessing for me to be here. What a great service so far. A Bria Shaw solo of I Wonder as I Wander, the promise of angel of ages, our rousing hymns and voices lifting us up, the reading in unison of the 148th Psalm with our praises reverberating across God's world. But wait, there's more to come. Our bell ringers will call us to God rescue Mary. And the grand tradition called, calls us to come, all ye faithful, will take us out back into the world. It's a good day for Christmas music and for praise. Noted English theologian Charles Spurgeon said of the 148th Psalm, It is a song of nature and grace, as a flash of lightning flames through the space and enwraps both heaven and earth in one vestment of glory. So doth the adoration of the Lord in this psalm light up all the universe and cause it to glow with the radiance of praise. The song begins in the heavens, sweeps downward to dragons and depths, and then ascends again to the people near unto Jehovah, take up the strings. It reminds me of our stained glass window. This past week, we have walked with Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. We have stood with the shepherds, surrounded by celestial wonders. We have seen the star of Bethlehem, and we have heard the band of angels singing glory to God in the highest. Can you still hear them echoing their joyous strain? And on a silent night, we gazed upon the perfect child of God laying in the manger. And today, we take another step into Christmas by going into the temple of, in Jerusalem with Mary and Joseph to offer and present to God and name their beloved firstborn son. We see the prophetess Anna, ancient and wise in years and devout in her faith. Who can say how many
many hundreds or perhaps thousands of children she saw in her lifetime presented in just this way. Yet today, she knows she has seen the Messiah and tells all who are there who seek redemption what she sees. And we learn of Simeon the prophet visited by an angel and told he will see the Messiah during his lifetime. He too knows who this baby is. Simeon holds Jesus aloft, proclaiming him to be the Messiah we have been waiting for. God saves, God incarnate, our Emmanuel, the everlasting Prince of Peace. Jesus the Christ meets his people for the first time in the persons of these two, Anna and Simeon. The word is fulfilled, salvation is here, Jesus is here. What a huge story this is. I'd like to share a smaller story with you, but no less powerful. It's about a little girl named Rosa, who gives her whole heart to Jesus on a silent night in the quiet of a dark church many hundreds of years ago. Let's travel now from the Temple of Jerusalem to a small town in Tuscany and hear this story written by James Philip Freeman called A Gift from Rosa. <clears throat> when St. Francis built the first crash, the stable scene of the birth of Jesus back in the 13th century People came from everywhere to look at it. Most people in those days knew little about anything, even about such an important event as the birth of Jesus. So when they gathered around the crash, Francis, who was a great storyteller, would tell them many legends and wonder tales connected with Christmas. Francis loved all living things, so his stories were often about birds and beasts. Here is one of them. Once upon a time, said St. Francis, there was a little girl named Rosa. She was very poor, so poor that often she didn't have enough to eat and had to go hungry to bed. What's that? You are feeling sorry for Rosa because she went hungry to bed? I've gone hungry to bed most of my life and I don't think I've missed much except for a few stomach aches. Rosa had a naturally sunny disposition, and had as this and as hard as this may be for more fortunate people like ourselves to understand, most of the time Rosa was happy. When she went down the street, she usually skipped, and when she was alone, she usually sang. Except for this thin shift she wore to cover her, she had only one small possession. This possession was a bird. It was a small bird, hardly larger than a sparrow and just as undistinguished. One spring day, as she went skipping and singing along, she found it lying in the street. She could see at a glance it was hurt and couldn't fly, so she picked it up. Hello, little bird, she said, and sang a few notes by way of greeting. The little bird did not sing back. It looked at her with piteous and frightened eyes and huddled in the hollow of her hand as if it wished to hide. She could feel the fluttering of its heart. Rosa had never held anything so soft and warm and small and helpless. All her life she had felt many needs, but she had never before felt anything needed her. This bird, she instantly knew, needed her. If she set it back down in the street, it would die. She carried it home with her. Rosa was used to making something out of nothing, so in short time, she had woven a little cage of twigs in which her bird could live as snugly as if it were a golden canary in a gilded cage. The bird was not like a canary. Not only was it plain, its song was no more than a croak. Rosa decided that whatever had affected its flight had also affected its voice. Rosa did not care what 
the bird was, she loved it. That was enough. The few crumbs she had, she shared with the bird, and she gave it all her heart. And with that, they both survived and grew. But time, the, but the time fall came, the bird could fly again. It flew uncertainly at first, but as winter approached and cold set in, Rosa felt the bird should fly south. One day she took it to the open window and held it up so it could fly away. You wouldn't have done that? No, perhaps I wouldn't have either. It was hard for Rosa to do it, but she loved the little bird so much that she thought more of its happiness than of her own. We don't often love anything that much. You are free, little bird, she whispered to it. You are free and winter is coming. Fly away to the south where it's warm and the fields and woods are full of good things to eat. But the bird, to her surprise and intense delight, did not fly away to the south. It flew up to her shoulder, gave a little chirp, and perched there quietly. Now a very great event was being celebrated in Italy that winter. This was, remember, a long time ago, almost at the beginning of everything. And it happens that that year was the first year people ever celebrated Christmas. I don't mean, said St. Francis, that it was the year Jesus was born. The birth of Jesus was hardly a celebration. Mary and Joseph, two weary travelers, came late one night to a little town named Bethlehem, where they couldn't even find a room in the inn and had to find lodging in the stable. There Jesus was born, but you know that. I've shown you what the event was like by this crash I've built. A few shepherds came, some angels flew down singing, and on the twelfth night the three kings brought their gifts. After that, nobody remembered the birthday for hundreds of years. But at last, hundreds of years after Jesus was born, the emperor of Rome became a Christian. When he did, he decided one day that they should have a special holiday to celebrate the birthday of Jesus. So he consulted the church fathers. At first, they didn't know what, to, what day to pick. His birthday fell on, but they decided it should be what day? Right the 25th day of December. When the people heard Christmas was to be celebrated, they rejoiced. Don't you? Is there anything you love more than a holiday? And is any holiday as wonderful as Christmas? Different people had different thoughts about ways to celebrate it, but about one thing, everything, everyone agreed. This was a birthday. There is only one way to celebrate a birthday, and that's to give the one who has the birthday a gift. Throughout all the world, people began thinking about what gift they might give the holy infant, for had there ever been such another birthday as his? When the great day came, everyone poured out of their homes to go to church. You never saw such a merry crowd or such a quality of lace and ribbon. Everyone who went to church wanted to look more magnificent than anyone else who was there. And everyone wanted everyone else to see how generously he gave. You never saw such gifts. It's impossible to list all the things. Gold and silver and jewels and houses and land and cattle and grain, and paintings and statues and even churches. There had never been such a gala occasion in the history of giving as that first Christmas. Everyone in the world must have put on his finest attire and gone to church to give his Christmas gift. Everyone except Rosa. She had been going to church every day for months. Every day from the moment she had heard there was to be Christmas, she had prayed before the statue she loved best. This was the statue of the Virgin with her baby in her arms. She had prayed that she might have a gift for her, but she had nothing to give. Not a single coin, not a single thing she could sell to gain a coin, not so much as a ribbon, nothing. Every day for months on her way home from church, she had looked about her eagerly, hoping to find, hoping for some miracle, like maybe finding a penny. But she found nothing. A month before Christmas, it snowed. After that, 
Since she had no shoes, she had to run to and from the church to keep her bare feet from freezing. She could take no time to loiter and look. Besides, the snow covered everything. So on Christmas Day, she did not go to church when all the others did. She sat alone and prayed, and prayed. I hope, unless she's gotten too miserable to pray, I know she cried. The tears ran down her face in burning streams. She was so miserable she didn't even think to eat, which was just as well, because I don't believe she had anything to eat. Perhaps this is why the bird began to chirp. It got hungry. It was a weak chirp because that was all the sound he ever made, but it caused Rosa to look at him. If you were only a fat goose, she thought, or even a plump young pigeon, I could give you. But he was not. He was just a plain little bird, not much bigger than a sparrow. Still, he was something. In fact, he was all she had. Why should she not give him to the Christ child? But could she? The child she felt would accept him, but the priest, she was sure, would turn her and her bird away. And the people, how would they laugh, how they would laugh to see her bringing such a sparrow as a birthday gift to him who was the king of heaven. But perhaps if she waited till it was dark. Darkness comes early on Christmas Day. She could steal into the church unseen and leave her gift without anyone noticing who she was or what she had brought. As night came down, Rosa slipped out into the streets, which was almost empty by then. Clutching the little cage of twigs tightly to her, she ran swiftly to the church, darting up the steps, and in a moment had slipped inside. It was dark inside, though here and there a candle burned. But Rosa knew the church by heart and quickly found her way through the shadowed emptiness to the statue of the Virgin with baby Jesus in her arms. You wonder why she didn't leave the little bird at the crash? I'm sure that's where you would have left him, and so would I. So would Rosa, if there had been a crash. But this is the 13th century, and that was almost a thousand years ago. There were no crashes in those days. Can you believe this crash I built is the first one there's ever been? But that's the way it is with everything. Everything has to start somewhere. So since Rosa had no crush, she took her gift to the best place she knew to take it, the Virgin and her baby. A few votive life still burned before the statue. Rosa had never lit a candle since she had no money to give, but she had lit many in her mind. What's that you say? You think you get more light from wax ones? I think you'll find that that's questionable. But as I was saying, Rosa knelt before the statue of the Virgin and prayed. I don't know how long she prayed. Like everyone who prays a lot, Rosa, I'm sure, had found prayer had nothing to do with time. A great deal of time can pass and nothing important happens, and no time at all of a miracle can occur. Suddenly, something strange began to occur. Rosa didn't speak a word aloud, nor did she hear an actual voice. Yet suddenly, a conversation began between Rosa and the Lord. What are you doing here, Rosa, said the Lord. What is the, was it the baby Jesus who spoke? I can't say, because the voice was not a voice Rosa heard with her ears. This conversation took place, I suppose I would have to say, in the mind like the candles she lit. But the voice was no less real because she heard it in her mind, since that's the only place you can hear voices anyway. It startled Rosa. She looked about to see if someone was there she hadn't seen. Then she heard herself saying, I've come to bring my gift on your birthday. You are late, said the Lord. My birthday is almost over, and I wondered if you were coming. I hoped you would. Thank you, Lord, said Rosa. I just thought I'd wait till the people had gone home and the church was empty. Don't you like my worshipers, said the Lord? Or do you think they might not like you? Rosa said nothing. What is it that you have in your hands, said the Lord softly at last. 
My gift, said Rosa. And what is that, said the Lord. Rosa did not know what to say. She couldn't bring herself to tell the Lord that all she had from him on his birthday was a little sparrow in a cage of twigs. At last she said, I have brought you all I have to give. This time it was the Lord who for a long time had nothing to say. I am sure he was looking at the little girl very closely and taking everything in, the bare feet, the thin shift, the thin arms and legs, the pale face, the huge hungry eyes. Do you suppose, as he looked, a tear or two stole down his face? The Bible says that once he wept. I don't mean tears of sorrow, but tears of love. That is the very great gift, he said at last, not even the emperor has given me that. What is it you are giving me? Silently, Rosa held out the little cage of twigs. When you give all you have to give, said the Lord, you almost always find that you have more to give than you dreamed. Let me see what you have. Shyly, Rosa opened the door of the cage and took out the little bird. He huddled for a moment in her hands, and as always, she could feel her heart beating wildly. Then, as if he too knew what to do, he flew up and hovered on whirling wings just above the face of the infant. And it seemed to Rosa that as he hovered there, he stretched forward and his beak touched the mouth of the infant as if in a kiss. Then he flew away into the darkness of the church. The girl gave a little cry of alarm to see the bird disappear. Then she heard the Lord again. You are the gift love has given to life, he was saying. Go, O oh love of life, and give the life to which you have to give. And at that moment out of the darkness came such a shower of notes as Rosa had never heard. The nightingale had found its voice. Rosa's bird that had no song was suddenly singing, and it was singing as no bird ever had sung, for Rosa's bird was the nightingale. If you have never stood alone in the dark and heard a nightingale's sound, I doubt if I can tell you what it is like. Poets have tried, but so imperfectly. It was not just a song, it was a flood, a tumult, an exuberant excess, joy rejoicing in its joyousness, passion pouring forth in chronicle invention, life delighting in aliveness, giving unstintingly without holding back. It was the song of one who gives all he has to give, only to find he has yet more and more. Then as suddenly as it had begun, the singing stopped. Rosa stared up into the darkness. She sensed that her bird was gone, but the song was not gone. It sang on in her, and the nightingale has been singing on for us ever since. What's that you want to know? What happened to Rosa? After that, what could happen to her? I've heard she lived a long, full, happy life. But she's already done that, hasn't she? Hadn't she? She'd given all she had to give and found that her gift was a nightingale song that men have thrilled to hear for a thousand years. You can't do much more than that, can you? Not even like Methuselah if you live to be more than 900 years. What's that you say? Maybe it all happened in Rosa's imagination? Maybe it did. Can you think of any other great and wonderful place that doesn't happen there? Mainly, at least. Take this crush I built. Where did it happen if not an imagination, or a church, or a story, or a nightingale song? Certainly a song. And one thing to think about until Rosa and the Lord's power touched him, the nightingale was just a plain little bird. After that, he was the nightingale. What's that? Nightingales don't sing in winter, they sing in spring. So they do, and aren't we lucky to have them? 
But this nightingale, this first nightingale, Rose's bird, as I have just told you, sang that Christmas, the first Christmas we ever celebrated. Yet that is where the nightingale learned to sing. Maybe it wasn't this way at all. Is that what you were thinking? Maybe Rose's bird had always been able to sing, always been a nightingale, but he had been hurt. Then there in the church flying free in the dark, he began to sing again. Very well, if that's what you want to believe. Some people explain away every miracle. Yet I have heard that sometimes, if you go alone, as Rosa went, and I have too gone, not on Christmas Eve when the church is full of people, but late on a Christmas night, or for that matter, any time when there's nobody there but you and the Lord, I've heard that some, not all, but some, have sometimes heard such music as poured forth from Rosa's bird. Or do you think perhaps it was an angel I heard singing? Let's be in prayer. Like Anna and Simeon and Rosa, let us live our lives with hearts open to love, ears open to hear, and voices raised to spread the good news. Christ is born for us. Thank you for sharing this time with me. It's been a blessing. Merry Christmas. share your joys and concerns with our church family in the comment section as you join me in a moment of silence. Listen to a Christmas prayer written by Robert Louis Stevenson. Give us, O oh God, the vision which can see your love in the world in spite of human failure. Give us the faith to trust your goodness in spite of our ignorance and weakness. Give us the knowledge that we may continue to pray with understanding hearts and show us what each one of us can do to set forward the coming of the day of universal peace. Loving God, help us remember the birth of Jesus that we may share in the song of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the worship of the wise men. Close the door of hate and open the door of love all over the world. Let kindness come with every gift and good desire, with every greeting. Deliver us from evil by the blessing which Christ brings and teach us to be merry with clear hearts. May the Christmas morning make us happy to be thy children and Christmas evening, bring us to our beds with grateful hearts, forgiving and forgiven for Christ's sake. I invite you to join me in the prayer Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our, us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are amazed and so thankful for the generous support you have shown through 2020 for the mission and ministries of DeKalb First United Methodist Church. We are looking forward to the amazing ways God will work through us in the new year. We plan to continue reaching new people through our online worship services and weekly radio broadcasts. We will continue food ministries like Summer Lunch in the Park and our monthly community real meal. We will help people to get to work and school through the Good Neighbor Fund. 
We will connect with children and youth through our Christian education and youth ministry activities. And we will continue to be a group of people who are living Christ's presence through love and service. If you are watching online today, but are a member of another church, please send gifts to your congregation to support the vital ministries in your local community. If you are unable to give financially right now because of layoffs and the economic effects of this pandemic, please consider offering your time and talents instead. To support our ministries, you have several options. Give online by going to church website, firstumc.net. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on the red e-giving button. You can choose from a variety of ministry funds to give to. You can also mail gifts to First United Methodist Church at 317 North 4th Street here in DeKalb. If you desire to make a gift before the end of the year, please mail it soon so that it's postmarked by December 31st. Again, thank you so much for your partnership with First UMC that allows us to be a community of faith making a great impact in DeKalb and beyond.
we give all that we have to give, we will have more to give than we have ever dreamed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much to Cynthia Terwilliger for her leadership and message this morning, and thank you so much for joining us for worship. Please join us again next Sunday, January 3rd at 9 a.m., when we will again be online only here on Facebook Live for worship. We will hear a great message from special guest speaker and former First United Methodist Church pastor, Rev. Mary Gay McKinney. Until we meet again, may you have a week full of hope, peace, joy, and love, and Happy New Year.